Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining today. My name is Gus Palman, and I'm an agronomist with Biomakers. And I'm joined today, I have the honor of, of being joined by Michelle Miller, who goes by the social media persona you may recognize, the Farm Babe. Um, and today we're going to be talking about some interesting uh, results that we, we received from, uh, from a farm that, that uh, the Farm Babe worked on and, and um, love to hear kind of some We'll be going through a case study and also talking about how some of these results um, provide insights on resilience of Midwest row crops and how soil health practices um, in, integrate in and relate to resilience. Um, so uh, we'll wait a couple more minutes before we fully get started, um, and then we'll do a little bit more formal introductions. But just for the next minute or two, we'll let some folks trickle in, um, and then we'll we'll get started. For everyone just joining, thanks for tuning in. We're um, waiting a minute or two as, as uh, more folks join, but um, we'll be getting started within the next minute or so. Well, thank you all for joining today. I think we're good to get started now. Um, for those who have not uh, joined one of our webinars previously or have not um, met with me, my name is Gus Palman and I'm an agronomist with Biomakers. And I'm joined today by uh, Michelle Miller, who goes by the Farm Babe, who has an awesome social media platform dedicated to demystifying agriculture. And um, today we're going to be talking about uh, resilience in Midwest row crops, uh, specifically pertaining to soil health practices. And we're going to go over some results we we have from Michelle's uh, farm. Uh, Michelle, if um, you wouldn't mind just giving a quick introduction, we'll go a little bit more into, into formal introductions in a minute, but um, we'd just love to, to get a quick introduction for the folks as we as we kick off. Yeah, <clears throat> thank you, Gus. So yeah, Michelle Miller, known as the Farm Babe on social media. I'm an advocate for agriculture, uh, online influencer, author, public speaker, all that good stuff, just working to bridge the gap between farmers and consumers and help people learn where their food comes from. And um, I do a lot of science-based uh, content and excited to be here today. So this farm was a farm that I was a part of for a while. Um, it's up in Iowa. It's like a corn and soybean farm, a good friend of mine. And um, so pretty, pretty familiar with the practices and excited to go over the results. So together we did, uh, I think was it five samples? And yes. we, uh, we did the five samples and I sent them in to you guys and your test, your lab, and we're getting the results back. So traditionally I know on this farm we had done the Haney test and I would say that this is almost kind of like the Haney test on steroids. <laughs> and so I think Gus, if you wanna jump right into it with the results, I think you guys have done a great job with communication. Just like I know when I sent it in, I got a lot of emails, very personalized email notifications just saying, hey, you know, we have it, we're working on it, here's your portal, here's your communication, here's your point of contact. And so let's dive into the results. Thank you so much, Michelle. It's really great to have you on today. Really glad you were able to make it. Um, yeah, as far as the Haney test goes, we're huge fans here at Biomakers of the Haney test as a complementary soil health tool that kind of ties together the biology and the chemical fertility that, of course, is also an essential element of soil health. Um, and many folks uh, who are turning to B-Crop to provide insights on their on their farms um, are starting to really look at us as kind of the, the leveled up version of, of phospholipid fatty acid, PLFA analysis. They're looking at 
it like that on steroids. Um, but we're, you know, really, really excited to have, you know, your background on this farm and also have some great results to go through here today. So um, to jump into our agenda, um, as far as, uh, you know, we'll, we'll, some of the talking points, we'll go over a quick introduction about biomakers and B-crop technology, what our, our testing entails, um, touching on the practical value of B-crop and what specific soil health related metrics we provide for, to, to generate insights and management practice recommendations. Then an introduction to the farm babe, Michelle, and a little bit more about her platform and, and all the great work that she does. Um, lastly, our, our major focus will be on the B-crop case study, so the test results, the five tests that uh, Michelle took on, on her farm and, and some of the interesting insights we can glean there, particularly a great case study given that the farm has been managed with soil health focused practices uh, very long term. So a lot of great insights on what we might expect to see in a, on a farm that has been you know, using cover crops, incorporating no-till and some of the other practices we'll go into. And then we're gonna tie this case study together with crop resilience and its importance, also how we can measure it with beet crop. And of course, with you know, significant droughts throughout sections of the Midwest this year and, um, and other, other factors relating to resilience of crops, bringing to light the importance of soil health and maintaining um, the ability of crops to produce under challenging conditions. So a lot of great tie-in to kind of the, what the egg industry is currently um, trying to overcome and and um, deal with, and then we'll leave. Uh, we'll aim to leave maybe 15 minutes or so for questions and answers at the end, as well as we typically do. And any questions that we aren't able uh, to get to, uh, you know, within the scope of this webinar, we'll um, answer offline and send you answers um, within the next week or so. So first of all, jumping into an overview of bee crop technology, and I'll try to be brief because I'm I'm sure many of our audience members are familiar, but for anyone who is new to bee crop and biomakers. Um, bee crop is, is our technology for decoding soil biology, um, better understanding the microbes in the soil, the bacteria and fungi predominantly, that drive processes uh, that we know are, we increasingly are aware of as an essential, uh, an essential, essential component of crop production. Um, so really the way that our testing works is, a, is essentially a two-step process. So well, we, we model soil functionality. We don't. We look at the biology that's there, but we don't just look at what species of microbes are present. Also, what they do in the soil. What functions do they perform? Like nutrient cycling, biocontrol that ultimately help um, help support crop health and product and productivity. So the first step, of course, is the soil sample. You know, when after a sample is taken, um, which is, can be taken according to very typical methodologies for a standard chemical fertility test. That sample is shipped to our lab or one of our partnership labs, and the analysis process is really is is where we get to the two step uh, the two step component. So first, the the soil is um, it, the DNA is extracted and then uh, it's sequenced to determine the species of microbes that are present um, and their abundance. So then that's our bio data, and our bio data, of course, is it's very complex. It's not going to lend itself very easily to, you know, understanding how how to take away insights and recommendations. So the second step in the process is to take that bio data and convert it into a functional analysis report. Um, and this is done through our functionality and, and microbial ecology pipeline, which looks at what 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 microbes are known to perform. So of microbes, we have spent the last seven to eight years compiling a, an extensive database of microbial functionality so that we know the typical functions of many of the major plant growth promoting um, species, what, you know, what, which species are pathogens. Um, and then uh, we, we also look at how microbes interact in the soil, you know, because of course, nothing, microbes in the soil don't exist in isolation. They're interacting, potentially competing, cooperating, complementing each other. Um, so that that sort of those functional traits and and interactive traits between the microbes are taken into account with uh, machine learning and and egg data to to basically pump out the functionalities of those microbes. What what are they doing in the soil relevant to crop production? And that's the the um, the end product of of bee crop is is a is a simplified analysis report. Um, and we also have some data analysis tools available in our portal that we'll be going through with this case study, as well as some higher level services like trials where we um, 
We take this functional data, we run statistical analysis to determine what the effects of an input product or management practice were um, with very robust statistical analysis. So B-crop test at, in its simplest per, form is the functional report that we provide in a PDF format. And these reports themselves can be used as data points to analyze yield improvements, assess nutrient cycling, improve nutrient use efficiency, um, evaluate disease risks, so identify what major fungal or bacterial pathogens are present in the soil and to what extent do they present a risk, and monitor on-farm on practices. So like we're going to do today, get some feedback on how your practices have influenced soil health, maybe what's worked well and what hasn't. Um, so, you know, long-term monitoring is a, is a major use case for our, our B-crop test. So to give a quick rundown on the data provided by B-crop tests, this is just, uh, this is actually isn't quite all encompassing of all the metrics that we have, but this hits on pretty much all the major areas that we look at on each individual report. We divide up our metrics into three main sections, soil quality, plant health, and nutrient cycling. Soil quality is, is uh, this section looks at sort of an eye in the sky view of the full microbial population. Um, biodiversity is, is one metric we look at, which is based on the number of species present. We have an overall functionality rating, uh, which is not based on the number of species, but based on what beneficial functions they perform. And of course, you know, certain species can perform many different functions. So we get kind of a composite indicator of how how many beneficial functions those microbes perform. Um, we also look at resilience, which of course is very relevant to what we'll be talking about today in terms of drought stress, how, how effective those microbes are at coping with stressful scenarios like drought or um, you know, significant high temperatures, even heavy rainfall and, and agronomic practices like heavy tillage that can cause um, stress on the soil. Um, we also include some ratios, which are not generally taken for agronomic advice, but do um, provide some idea of the bounce between fungi and bacteria in total and the bounce between um, the two main types of mycorrhizal fungi or buscular and ectomycorrhizae just to give some idea of how that population breaks down. Um, the plant health section is where we get into essentially the plant growth promoting functions out, aside from nutrient cycling that are known to support yield and plant productivity. We identify soil borne diseases um, levels of natural biocontrol agents, so microbes that can help suppress diseases and, and pests such as insects or nematodes. We also look at microbes that produce uh, phytohormones or PGRs, plant growth promoters, plant growth regulators, that, um, such as auxin, cytokinin. So that in this way, these you know, microbes that produce these phytohormones can play an important role in boosting plant growth. And then we also lastly look at plant stress adaptation. Um, these basically what we're looking at is, is compounds microbes produce that help plants deal with stress and, and disturbance, including drought, um, pathogens, um, salinity in the soil. So that also ties in heavily to resilience and, and the ability of, this, of soil health to um, promote uh, yield under challenging growing conditions. Um, and then our last section is nutrient cycling, where we look at all the different functions microbes perform relevant to unlocking and releasing nutrients for plant uptake. We of course look at uh, N, P, and K, our, our big three macronutrients, um, and set, we look at several functions that microbes perform involved in the cycling of, of you know, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. We also look at several metrics related to carbon cycling, including carbon fixation, um, and also carbon loss functions where microbes are actually causing loss of carbon from the soil. So we give a strong functional um, a functional look at how likely microbes are to be sequestering carbon or actually causing the loss of carbon from the soil. Um, when not, one of those carbon-related functions is organic matter breakdown or decomposition, which of course is very relevant to a grower's uh, residue, residue decomposition control of their, their stubble on their fields. And then we also look at micronutrient pathways, so functions uh, that microbes perform involved in unlocking nutrients like sulfur, zinc, and iron, and how, how effectively microbes can help you know, bridge the gap between those, those micronutrients and uh, make, promoting their, their way into the plant. So these are really just the kind of big bullet, big bullet point um, metrics that we look at, but within each of these, you know, our reports can, uh, contain quite a few um, individual metrics across these, these subsections. And we'll be getting into quite a few of these when we, when we uh, go into um, Michelle's case study. 
So now I'll, I'll turn it over to you, Michelle, and let you give a, a rundown on your platform and, and all the great work that you do um, before we uh, move on to the case study. Oh, is your, is your, sorry, Michelle, you're muted right now. I, <laughs> you're still there. Okay, we just, there we go. Just sorry there. about that. Thanks. <laughs> yeah. So I, I talked about it earlier, but I was a farmer for almost a decade um, in Iowa, grew row crops, uh, corn and soybeans. The farm that we're doing the case study on today is actually the farm that I was a part of in those years. And uh, I raised cattle and sheep. So we were up in Northeast Iowa, kind of near the Decora area. And I have a social media platform where I work to raise awareness and education um, about agriculture. So kind of bridging that gap between consumers and farmers and just have a pretty big agricultural audience to be an advocate for our industry. So thanks for having me today. Of course. And, uh, you know, we're, we're really honored and happy to be connecting with someone who bridges that gap because we know that, you know, agriculture is a huge industry, especially in the U.S., but um, it doesn't always translate, you know, to the consumers who are, you know, purchasing goods that may, you know, may be grown in the U.S. But of course, you know, and of course, you drive across many vast sections of the U.S. and see a lot of farmland. But um, as as an industry, it's of course, you know, not something that is necessarily um, heavily involved in, you know, mainstream talking points. So great, great work that you're doing, and and really glad that you know there's people out there like you helping demystify agriculture and bring some of the important elements of it to the you know general public and 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 to consumers yeah exactly i think this farm would be something we would call very regenerative <laughs> but there's all the buzzwords but what do the buzzwords mean you know and and a, a lot of these you know the way that we farmed in iowa isn't the way that maybe they farm in georgia or california or whatever right but this is what has worked really well for us farming in the midwest and so yeah no-till, yeah, I mean, cover crops, all that good stuff. Yeah, that's that's what made this case study really exciting is that this is a great look at a long-term, a farm that has taken regenerative practices, picked them up and, and been practicing them pretty long-term. Um, Michelle, I know you, you pretty much just gave a lot of the important context on this farm that we're going to be discussing here and, and also wanted to point out that the uh, grower who you know Michelle is very familiar with has has earned environmental leadership awards for the regenerative practices on this farm. So Michelle, if you have any other details of of you know the farm or any other practices, uh, any of the regenerative practices to touch on, um, feel free yeah. to elaborate now, and we'll we'll of course go into some more detail in a minute. Yeah, Doug has earned awards for Farmer of the Year for Soil and Water Conservation. Um, his brother is a soil scientist with NRCS, and so always just kind of the guinea pig on the front lines for the latest and greatest soil health practices and principles. Um, so his brother, you know, would travel around and do a lot of the slight test stuff or the rainfall simulator, anything that anybody's familiar with, with the regenerative practices of what kind of what the NRCS is doing. And so, you know, we're always really big on top of that. So I think, I think he's been no-till cover crops for like 25 years, something like that. Um, and I think it's allowed him to really improve that soil health quality, um, cut back on pesticide usage and anything like that. And, you know, the proof is in the pudding with the with the soil health. And so I know we're going to be talking about that here. But yeah, it, he's always been really big into, you know, crop rotation, soil testing, you know, just what can we do working with biology first um, to improve those soil conditions as best as we could to, you know, showcase the the results and and i think that's what we're here to talk about is how doing these practices can really help your plants and your soil yeah absolutely. And your yield. yeah, yeah. I, and you know big you hit on really i and you know i know we previously talked to doug and i i got kind of the rundown on his it, you know the practices and it sounds like the no-till and cover crop i think has really really showed up in these results and he also mentioned of course the as you touched on, um, not using fungicides. I was very surprised to hear that as, you know, a lot of fungal pathogens are simply, you know, very, very severe to the point where it's it's hard for many growers to envision growing without any fungicides and many who are um, putting it out preventatively kind of as a, as a risk, uh, as a risk mitigation measure. So I think that Doug is some proof that with, over time with improved soil health, you can suppress diseases, you know, naturally and cut down on some of those costs of crop protection products. Um, and then of course, also you mentioned the livestock operation and, and how um, it, you said sheep and cattle that you, you guys have, 
are, are or we're producing, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So he he had mentioned the use of of their manure as a soil amendment, and of course that is you know kind of connecting the the circular natural processes of nutrient cycling. You know, as we harvest crops, there's you know going to be you know some biomass taken out in the form of the nutrients that they they absorb, but and of course, you know, putting down fertilizer helps compensate, but uh, manure, you know, any organic, high organic matter amendment like manure compost is gonna also help reinvigorate that soil, provide the microbes with some, you know, carbon and other uh, micronutrients, um, and, and also inoculate the soil with some of the microbes present in that compost or manure. So um, a wide facet of, of practices that Doug and, and you have, have integrated on this farm and. Um, now we'll we'll jump into some of the results and feedback on on how these practices have performed. Um, this first uh, summary here. So this was for one of the five tests uh, that was was taken on Doug's farm, and this is so this is our this is our from our the first page of our PDF reports. The summary of the three main um, categories that we look at: soil quality, plant health, and nutrition. And generally, when we look at these reports, the way that we interpret them is based on our soil database. So we score each each sample is scored according to how it compares to our database. And this this shows uh, our the zero to one hundred curve that we utilize as a percentile scale. So if a if a metric rates very low in the bright bright yellow here, that means it falls in the zero to twentieth percentile of our database of samples. And that's a crop our our database is crop specific. So for Corn samples, you know, this would, if a sample scored very low, that would mean it falls somewhere in the zero to 20th percentile of all of our corn samples. Whereas if it rates very high, that means it falls in the 80 to 100th percentile and is represented by the dark blue. So that that just gives a very, a, this is all quantitative information and, and we do have um, a free online portal that can provide the specific percentile number for each of the metrics. But our individual reports are designed to be simplified and, and, and a little bit easier to read at first glance. So we simply have the qualitative sounding five point scale from very low to very high. And I'd say for our typic, typical reports we receive from, I would say most, most integrated farms that are doing some regenerative practices, but still sticking to a lot of you know, conventional practices, like say some, you know, some tillage or, or um, you know, putting out preventative fungicides, most often, the summary page has a, a mix of yellow and some gray and blue. So usually it's rare that we have most metrics um, in the medium to high range, but that's generally what we like to see for most of our metrics is medium to high, meaning they're you know within the 50th percentile or so or, or above. Um, so this this test was a good example of, of one of one of uh, Doug's uh, soil samples that really showed pretty solid numbers across the board with some of the nutrition metrics, phosphorus and potassium potentially showing some area for improvement, but across the rest of the samples, really that was not a consistent problem. So overall, the results looked very good as, as we, as we you know, expected based on Doug's practices. Um, and you know, like I said, vast majority of the metrics that we look at across, particularly across soil quality and plant health, but then also the carbon and nitrogen um, functions were were sufficient, we would say medium to high, very solid. Um, and then phosphorus and potassium, maybe some potential for improvement, but it was not a consistent issue across the 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 rest of the samples from this field. So now to go into all five of the samples and just give a quick rundown, you know, some more detail on the specific uh, microbial indexes that we look at. So soil quality, again, looks across the entire population of microbes um, and how that population breaks down. Higher biodiversity, which generally we like to see, means that more soil microbial species are present and are well represented, meaning there, there's not one or two species that are out representing all of the others, but they're relatively evenly represented. And we see, so here we have Doug's samples numbered one through five, and then we have the um, this color, these color-coded um, squares representing um, the results for each each metric. And we can see biodiversity was very strong in, in samples one and two, still pretty strong, was high in, in three, um, and was a little bit on the lower side in four and five. But of course, biodiversity, it doesn't necessarily tell the entire story because you can have a lot of microbes present, but they may not necessarily be the good guys, the beneficial microbes that you like to see. So that's where functionality helps us um, helps us tease out that that um, that finding a little bit more clearly. So functionality looks at all the you know plant growth promoting functions those microbes perform, 
And that was very strong across the board in these samples from number one and number five being very high, but numbers two through four also measuring in the high range, meaning they were at least at least the 60th percentile, um, but most of these were higher than that. So um, strong, strong results in terms of soil quality. And then diving into plant health, in terms of disease risk, um, we really didn't see, you know, gen we did see some diseases that were detected. So here we have any, any pathogens, you know, these are diseases that we were able to detect any of the causal pathogens for. But you can see that the risk level was low. And generally, if, if risk level is, is, is medium to very high, that means there's a, very, there's a major concern for pathogens, but very low to low generally means that it's, it's, uh, the, the pathogen is present and it's worth keeping, you know, noting and keeping an eye on, you know, throughout the season with crop scouting. But at the, at the time of analysis is not considered a major risk. And this is, of course, based on the abundance of the pathogen but it's also based on the beneficial microbes, the biocontrol agents that are present. Because of course, we sometimes see that in a field, there may be a high, high abundance of a pathogen, but sometimes the beneficial microbes are able to help keep, them, keep that pathogen in check through you know, their beneficial functions. So um, we, also, we also integrate that into this risk assessment. And one thing, Michelle, I wanted to touch on here, I was really excited and, and happy to hear from Doug that he hasn't used fungicides in recent years, um, just given, you know, a lot of disease risks are, you know, are significant to the point where there's not necessarily an easy alternative. But of course, with soil health focused practices and some of the other parameters we're about to look at, um, you can increase the disease suppressive biological properties of soil. So. Um, I just wanted to touch on that and ask, are, in your experience um, managing the farm, were there any diseases that you guys did have major issues with, or um, was the soil, gen did you generally have a pretty smooth sailing as far as, um, as far as controlling disease? It's been pretty good. We had, I remember what year was it? I want to say like 2015 or 16 or something like that. I think it was an exceptionally wet year. And I think we had a little bit of SDS, like the Southern death syndrome in soybeans, but, um, I, uh, I don't think it, it wasn't anything really major. It was pretty minor. That was the only time I can remember any type of disease. That's great to hear. Yeah. Of course, environment there's, you know, when it comes to disease, we like to talk about there being kind of three main, main points on the disease triangle or three main factors that influence disease. And of course, one of them is, um, you know, the host, the plant itself, how susceptible it is. And in a stressful year, it might be more susceptible, whether there's too much rainfall or drought. Um, and then, of course, you have, you know, the, the disease itself, the presence of that, that pathogen, um, you know, whether or not it happens to be present in your, in your geography in a particular year in, in high levels. And then you have the environmental conditions, which, of course, we have no control over. I mean, unless you have, you know, center pivots, you have some control over over irrigation and moisture levels, but in general, Mother Nature does, you know, does what it wants, and we're left to left to figure out those other two aspects of the disease triangle: the, you know, helping the host plant be ready to deal with disease, and of course, um, you know, helping helping mitigate that disease presence, which often is done through, you know, fungicides uh, and and other crop protection products, which of course are are very effective, but. Generally, if possible, you know, it's growers know fungicides, especially in the last few years, have shot up in price, and many growers are increasingly aware that fungicides can have a negative effect on some of those beneficial fungi in the soil, in addition to the pathogens. So um, it's great to hear that, you know, for the most part over the last eight years or so, the the farm has been very resilient to disease, and even when you had the sudden deaths pop up, it, it sounds like it wasn't too significant of an issue. So Yeah, and I think it's important to note, too, in our region, uh, northeast Iowa, there, we're not using any type of irrigation, so we're, we're just doing whatever Mother Nature's doing. <laughs> so I know yeah. some other parts of the country, they have more control over, you know, water um, or, or worse, but for us, it was never really an issue. Yeah, yeah, of course, with non-irrigated fields, you're especially left up to, you know, to Mother Nature's decisions as far as um, drought, heavy rainfall, you know, other, other environmental stressors on, on crops. So that's where soil health becomes increasingly important, the less, you know, the less control you have over, over you know, climate and other aspects that Mother Nature throws at us. So Yeah, and I'm, and I'm just digging back into the memory bank, so I'm not completely sure, but I'm pretty sure that was the situation. I think that was the year, but yeah, it was a while ago. 
Yeah, so to touch on some of the reason why we suspect there hasn't been any you know, significant disease issues in recent years, this is something that we measure with Beecrop, our biocontrol agent section under plant health. So this is where we examine the microbes that can suppress pests and pathogens. So these are beneficial microbes that may suppress um, pathogens by directly uh, consuming them, parasitizing them, or feeding on them. Um, they might excrete enzymes that suppress certain pests or pathogens, or they may actually have an ecological niche that um, suppresses, that, that mitigates the impacts of those pests and pathogens. Like mycorrhizal fungi may you know, cling to the roots of crops and they make it harder for pathogens uh, you know, that might parasitize and, and infect the plant through those roots to, to get established. So within biocontrol agents, we noticed fungicide agents measured very well. Generally, samples one through three in the medium range, sample four was a little lower, but sample one measured uh, this, or this was actually number number five, I called it. This one on the far right measured high. So fungicide agents are those microbes that, you know, both bacteria and fungi that can suppress pathogenic fungal species that can help mitigate the um, impacts of those pathogens. So, you know, over time, the hope is with cover cropping, no-till, you know, incorporating organic amendments like manure, is that you can help cultivate these populations of fungicide agents and they can help, you know, suppress those, those pathogens so that, you know, fewer fungicides need to be used and, and overall yield can be improved with less, less disease pressure year over year. Um, so that I, I speculate based on these results that this, this played a big role in, in disease suppressiveness over the last eight, 10 years. And I, I, we also look at bactericide, insecticide, and nematicide agents. And in the gray, that those are samples where these were not detected. Now, I would say across most row crops, particularly corn and soybean, um, fungal pathogens are, are really the, the main point of, in, of, of, uh, of focus for crop protection. But of course, in many areas, we have like soybean cyst nematodes and, and insects that can be very detrimental to row crops like corn and soy. But in certain regions, it's not as significant of an issue, and generally it varies by region. So in some cases, there may just not be a heavy load of insects or ne nematodes. And many of these uh, insecticide and nematicide agents, particularly the fungi, they like to feed on insects or nematodes. So if there's not a big population of insects or nematodes there in the soil for them to feed on, that might lead to them you know, not really being pre present at very high levels. Because when there are nematodes or insects, that's kind of like ringing the dinner bell for them. Um, but it sounded like, Michelle, based on our, our conversations with Doug, that insects and, and nematodes haven't been a, a major issue as well as bacterial pathogens. So not quite as much of a point of emphasis as maybe the, the fung fungicide agents are. Um, and Correct. and for, for practical purposes, I just wanted to point out that there's a lot of biofungicide, biopesticide, bionematicide in products on the market. And a lot of those products contain microbes that fit under these biocontrol agent categories. So in the short term, that's certainly something that can potentially improve these values of biofungicide, bio, biocontrol products that are designed to introduce these types of microbes to the soil. So now going on, this, this is still in our plant health section. This is our phytohormone and stress adaptation section that we have displayed here. Again, we have the samples numbering one through five left to right. And this section really, I mean, we can see it's mo for the most part all blue here. Um, I'm not gonna spend too much time harping on all of these individual metrics, but basically what we're looking at here are the microbes that promote plant growth and resilience to stress by producing various metabolites and, and essentially donating them to the plants, um, plant root system. So higher levels of, of these, these function, these uh, metabolites, these microbes that can produce these uh, compounds um, means that we have we have more uh, potential to to help the plant grow and mitigate stress over time. Like oxen, cytokine, and gibberellin are all plant growth hormones, and of course we know they're they're you know sold or or precursors of these of these phytohormones are sold as PGRs that at, when applied as foliar products can produce a very uh, noticeable yield bump and, and bigger bump in plants. What's less commonly focused on in agronomy is that microbes can produce these PGRs too. So rather than applying them, you know, and, and they can of course be very expensive products. If you have a solid population like we see here, particularly for cytokinin and gibberellin, then you have microbes that are supplying those, those beneficial compounds right in the soil, right where your plants need them. 
And quite a few of, so going across this list, everything below gibberellin is uh, focused. These are, are compounds that help plants deal with various forms of stress. Um, exopolysaccharide production helps improve soil aggregation, so helps in, in, improve soil texture and um, thus improves water retention um, and nutrient retention in the soil. So that can, of course, help a plant deal with drought conditions. ACC deaminase is a stress response hormone. And then the rest of them all focus on various types of forms of stress that plants may encounter. Um, heavy metal resistance, as the name implies, these, this is a suite of functions that microbes perform to help mitigate the potential for heavy metals to cause phytotoxicity. That one, of course, is going to be more of a major concern in soils that have heavy metal issues. Um, so not, you know, that was one of the ones that did measure low, but it's not necessarily a major concern in soils like this where heavy metals aren't, aren't a major issue. Um, and of course, salt tolerance, uh, that's another one where we're looking at, you know, multiple microbial functions that play a role in mitigating salt stress on the plant. Of course, that becomes a major issue when we talk, you know, drought conditions and, and um, particularly soils that are simply naturally high in salt. But um, plants, of course, salt can inhibit a plant's ability to uptake nutrients at healthy rates. So having microbes there that can actually help process and release some of that salt buildup can really play an important role in, in crop resilience. And you know, there's been a lot of work in the re in the literature and in, in uh, academia and, and agricultural research lately to connect the role of soil microbes to the benefits to crops in terms of drought stress, pathogen resistance, and other forms of stress. Um, so what we're able to do here with bee crop is connect those those areas where the research is starting to understand the role that microbes play. And then you can get some feedback on how effectively those microbes are helping promote resilience um, in the soil, which in this case, you know, like I said, generally we don't, we see, uh, we see a, a mix of yellow and blue. And this particular section, you know, we, we generally see pretty strong blue across the board, um, aside from heavy metal resistance. So very, very strong results indicating that we have uh, a lot of plant growth promoting microbes here to help, help mitigate stress. And of course, you know, this year being a, a particularly strong drought year, that's been, you know, when we talk stress, that really has been the main topic of conversation with growers. Um, and it seems like it's not necessarily going away anytime soon. You know, there have been some historic droughts, you know, within the last, just, just the last uh, 10 years or so. And of course, you know, with droughts seeming to become more prevalent, so, soil health's role in, in helping mitigate drought stress and other forms of stress is as important as ever. Um, and we've even seen, you know, as we're talking to growers who have their bee crop reports coming back and we go over results with them, we do often, you know, ask for their experience in the field. How is their crop doing? And generally when these metrics, these uh, stress adaptation and phytohormone metrics are stronger in their results, they tend to say our crop is doing better than we expected through drought. Whereas Growers who have more, a lot more yellow here and lower, lower rated metrics often are, are reporting um, increased drought stress on their crops. So we're glad to see that these, this uh, scientific data we have does seem to be panning out to the field and some of the growers who are, are facing some of these significant drought conditions this year. So, and to tie in the science behind some of this, so, you know, like I said, the science is, is starting to increasingly catch up to some of these biological factors that, that, uh, that improve plant stress tolerance. These were just a couple research papers that I pulled, which touch on some of these um, specific microbial functions we look at. Um, this first paper looked at um, the effects of polysaccharides, which we, we look at exopolysaccharides as a, essentially a biofilm type substance that increases, like I said, improved soil aggregation, soil texture, and can alleviate drought stress. So that was, you know, this, this paper tied together the role of plant growth promoting bacteria um, in, in terms of polysaccharides they produce and also in phytohormone production. And that, of course, that's, those are, are those phytohormones like auxin, cytokinin, uh, ACC deaminase that we were able to measure the microbes that produce these on our reports. Um, and then this, this paper here is a review paper on drought stress and the, and the role of plant growth promoting bacteria. Um, and generally, what the takeaway quote from this paper was that drought aggravates other stressors like salinity, pathogens. Of course, a stressed out plant dealing with drought may actually be more susceptible to pathogens. And of course, heat stress, which often tends to coincide with drought. 
and uh, this paper, which reviewed a lot of a lot of research on plant growth promoting bacteria, um, found that use of use of these microbes is is one of the most promising uh, methods for drought mitigation in agriculture. Um, so moving forward, we see all the biological products, biostimulants on the marketplace, um, and, and a lot of them really showing benefits. And you know, I, I don't think they're going away anytime soon. And and of course, bee crop can serve as an effective method to proof out whether those those um, those biological biostimulant products are 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 uh, per, are effectively improving the biology to support the claims that they make on their labels. And of course, like Michelle said, that you know the same methods that are used in you know Iowa might not serve effectively in Georgia. You know, there's not necessarily silver bullets out there in terms of soil health. So using bee crop can help proof out some of these plant growth promoting um, bacterial and fungal products to better understand what works in your soil and what doesn't. Um, lastly, we have our nutrition metrics where um, generally, you know, these are all of our nutrient cycling functions that microbes perform, including nitrogen fixation, phosphorus solubilization, um, to help promote plant availability of these nutrients. And overall, we saw very solid results. This is just we do have some more specific nutrient functions within carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, but this is just looking at our overall results for all of the microbes that cycle these nutrients. Um, carbon looked very solid, generally in the, the high to very high range. Um, nitrogen, there was some room for improvement in the first two samples um, in four and five, but it's very common in, in row crop fields for nitrogen to, to be fairly low. And generally, these were stronger than many, many samples we look at in terms of nitrogen. Um, phosphorus and potassium, I mentioned in sample number three we went over initially, there's a little bit of room for improvement. And three out of five of the samples showed medium, so 40 to 60 percentile um, within our database of phosphorus and potassium um, cycling microbes that can help unlock you know, P and K that's, that's locked up in the soil. And then the micronutrients look really solid as well from iron down uh, through magnesium. Uh, manganese did show a little bit lower and we talking with Doug, I think he mentioned that manganese has been a little bit of an issue here and there. What this can help do is help you proof out whether, you know, if, if you have a lot of microbes here, for, you know, helping cycle these nutrients, like in the case of zinc, um, these numbers were very strong. But if, if a farmer isn't getting that zinc in their crop, they're seeing deficiencies in the tissue, and this can help proof out whether that's a biological issue or whether that's maybe a, an issue of supply of the total amount of zinc or other nutrients in the soil. Um, so this is this plays a great role. This nut nutrition section, in conjunction with uh, conventional chemical fertility report, can give another another uh, dimension of of what of you know what factors help promote nutrient availability in the soil. In the short term, of course, foliar applications may be an efficient way to. In, improve nutrient uptake by plants, but overall, over the time, over time with soil health practices, you know, we the hope is to have a report that looks mostly blue like this, really very solid nutrient cycling um, throughout most of most of the samples and most of the nutrients we look at. Um, and some other analytics that we we also offer with our bee crop portal platform that I also wanted to touch on. We have uh, this explorer tool, which is. Uh, what we have here is a look at all of the microbes detected in one individual sample. And when you, our portal is, is free to access and every client who sends in as, as few as one sample will, uh, one soil sample will receive a login so that they can utilize these tools. So this is a great way to, to look for specific microbes of interest. You can search for microbes names. Um, and when you're in the portal, if you hover your cursor over all of these circles, each circle represents a species. And as you hover over it, it'll pop up the name of that species and its abundance uh, out of in terms of that sample. So kind of resembles a Petri dish, but unlike most Petri dishes in a lab, which only contain maybe one or two types of microbes, here we look at all the different microbes thanks to our genomic sequencing that can uh, differentiate, differentiate by fungus, um, yeast, types of mycorrhizal fungi, arbuscular and ectomycorrhizae, um, many protists we can detect, um, including things like Pythium, Phytophthora, uh, bacteria, of course, are a big component of what we look at, and then archaea. So you can filter and sort according to what microbes of interest you might want to look at. Um, we also have a tool to compare the abundance of specific microbes. So that last tool is more for exploring, for looking at what microbes are present. This is our abundance box plot tool, and this allows you 
um, to look at the levels of specific species or groups of, of fungi and bacteria and other microbes. So this actually, this was uh, three of, of Doug's samples. And what we're looking at here is the abundance of fusarium. So fusarium, of course, is a big group of fungi that many can cause um, diseases. These were not, we didn't necessarily see fusarium present at very high levels. We can see it's less than 2% of the total fungal population, but we do see sample three is a little bit lower at 0.5% versus these other two being above 1.4%. Uh, so this can help inform crop protection programs. If you sample different fields, you can determine which fields have the, the heaviest load of fusarium or other uh, pathogens. And of course, this can help save money on crop protection products and inform um, your program so that there's not as much guessing. You know, you're more certain on which which fields have the most need for crop protection products or other methods to reduce pathogen risk. So that that sums up um, our results. I know that I was trying to get through with a, with 15 minutes time for any questions we might have. Um, but uh, yeah, really, really excited about these results, Michelle, because I think this is a great example of what regenerative farming can do. And, um, and really happy that we were able to shed some light on, on, on how some of Doug's practices have really, um, really panned out in terms of positive soil, soil health um, outcomes. So I'm gonna go ahead yeah. now and see, see what questions we have on the line. There we go. So first question. Um, hi, how can I send samples from Brazil? The limit of days in transit is a problem. Is there restrictions to send soil from Brazil? So we do have um, import permits. We're also working with some labs in Latin America to potentially help facilitate the analysis process, whether they're able to export samples um, you know, to our labs in, in the United States or do some of the processing in-house. Um, we'll we'll get in contact with you for some of the specifics there for Brazil because I know it certainly is possible. We've we've done a lot of sampling out of Brazil, many South American and Central American countries. So so we'll get in contact and and discuss specifics there. Um, but we do have import permits on our side as well as lab capabilities um, internationally to to promote um, access to our our um, our B crop services. Um, uh, and also, you know, feel free to continue to, to send in any questions that you guys might have. We have a handful here, but just want to let you know that, that you, the Q&A box is still open. Um, so we received a question from an ag consultant in Latin America, and they asked, do you have business in Mexico, Peru, Central America, and Brazil? So I think I just answered that. We do have, have business in Latin America within, I, I, we've had samples out of Mexico, Brazil, and I, I believe Peru as well, um, although not totally certain. So um, Def, we'll, we'll connect with you as well after the call and be happy to talk about some of um, the work we've done in Latin America and how we can support your crop consulting. Um, another question from the same um, participant, with the biodiversity and fungal bacterial ratio, do you just get involved with the genus or determine the species of everything within the soil? That's a great question. So the way it works now, it's, you know, there many microbes are not, have not been identified, it, you know, really, Soil microbiology, the field of soil microbiology maybe has only identified 10 to 20 percent of, of soil microbes, bacteria, and fungi. Many are unnamed, so there, there's no name down to the species level. What's great about our technology, we are able to go down to the species level with our, our sequencing, so we can go more specific than genus. But for any non-named species that, that we detect, if we're not able to assign it to any known species, you know, any known genome of of a, of a microbe, then we go to the next closest taxonomic level, which of course is genus. So that's a great way, you know, so G, at the genus level, we can still take away some functional information based on how similar that microbe is taxonomically to other species, either within that genus or other similar um, species, you know, at the family level. So we do go down both the species and genus level, and that that is one of the benefits of our technology is that even if we, even if it's a non-named species, we are able to generate functional data on on its um, functional potential. So, 
Yeah, so one question we got, um, it was in, in uh, reference to an organic farm. Um, according to a visit we had to an organic farm, viral virus infection is, a bit, is their biggest problem. Do you have any monitoring of control agents against viruses? So, um, so un unfortunately, we, uh, we don't look at viruses. Our sequencing technique strictly looks at, um, at microorganisms like bacteria, fungi, and archaea, protists. Um, but fortunately, we do have some insight. There's many insects that are, are um, vectors of viruses and other species like bacteria and fungi that can even be vectors of viruses. So if you have a known vector for a virus, we can, we can look at that species um, of, of bacteria and fungi. And then with insects, our insecticide agent function we look at might, might indirectly relate to viruses that might be transmitted um, through your, or other, other um, diseases that can be transmitted through an insect. Because of course, if you have more insecticide agents reducing the prevalence of that insect, then any, any diseases it might be a vector for will be, be reduced. Um, what, great question we got, how do retailers and manufacturers utilize your technology? So I, I, we do work with a lot of ag input retailers and manufacturers, and a, a big focus of our work with them is bee crop trials. So with bee crop trials, we offer a, a higher level of sampling intensity to, to increase the scientific robustness of the results. With trials, what we often, what, we have a standard setup where we'll analyze a, a plot uh, before a treatment has been applied. And then we'll, we'll basically have that plot split up into a control section and experimental treatment section. So we'll, we'll test each section before any treatment is applied when there's no difference between them. And then we'll pull samples after a treatment, whether that's a, you know, a biological input product or a management practice, we'll, we'll test the soil after that treatment has been applied and then test the control plot that never received that treatment and we'll look at how they change over time so that we can isolate and identify the effects of that input or treatment on the soil microbiome. And we also run statistical analysis in-house um, to, to uh, identify where there is are statistically significant changes due to the input um, or where, you know, and, and that way we can definitively say the change was driven by the input. So it wasn't due to random variability or, you know, weather or temperature. Um, we can identify the effect and the significance of that, that product's um, effect in the soil. So that's our retailers and manufacturers that really helps proof out what their product does in the soil, maybe how their products, how its effects vary based on location, based on soil type or cropping system. Um, and oftentimes we identify unexpected modes of action um, of biological or biostimulant products. So we can sometimes see maybe a, a product is sold as a biofertilizer but we also see that it helps improve the populations of microbes that you know, promote plant stress tolerance or, or serve as biocontrol agents. Um, so that's a bee crop trials is, you know, feel free to get in, in touch with our team if you'd like to discuss further in terms of bee crop trials, but that's really our big use case when it comes to uh, ag input retailers and manufacturers. Um, we also have retailers who are using our testing as a diagnostic tool to identify you know, what out of their portfolio of products, what would work best to boost, say, nitrogen cycling or phosphorus solubilization or serve, provide a biocontrol agent. So a lot of retailers are also using our tests, not on a trial basis, but on, a, on an individual sample basis or sets of samples to identify their clients' areas of need and prescribe products that are valid. That, of course, helps take the guessing game out of biologicals, helps ensure that you're gonna get ROI um, and helps ensure that the retailer is, is most effectively placing their product um, uh, with, with data driving that, that placement. Um, similar to you know, conventional, how conventional fertility tests are used to prescribe fertilizer inputs. Um, let's see. Uh, what experience do you have with perennial crops, uh, all, like almonds, pistachios, fruit trees? That's another question we got. Uh, we worked quite heavily with uh, perennial crops, um, you know, all three of those, uh, particularly vineyards are, you know, grapevines are where we've done a lot of sampling, but um, similar with a lot of fruit trees and nuts, we've done a lot of sampling across citrus. I know um, uh, apple orchards, almonds, um, pistachios. So. Uh, general, our database is over 170 crops currently, um, and generally every major agronomic crop we currently have in that database. So 
um, we've, we've done pretty well with perennials. Um, and of course, any new crop that may be niche and not integrated into our database, we, we can certainly do that. And, and we have uh, mechanisms for um, getting a, a getting a, a tailored disease list for any new crops. Um, but yeah, with perennial crops, we've, we've done a lot of work um, in terms of evaluating inputs, um, for, uh, recommending management practices, um, and special, not just perennials, but we've also worked with a lot of specialty crops that are annual, that are treated as annuals, like strawberries. Um, another question we got, how long does it take for you, for you to deliver the analysis data? So uh, generally our turnaround time is two to three weeks. Now it does vary a little bit. Depend we have a quality control process in which we, if a sample does, if we aren't able to get enough uh, bacterial or fungal DNA out of a sample, we'll often rerun it until we can get enough DNA. That rerunning process will take the sample back to you. And that can make it take a little bit longer than two to three weeks. But currently, that's our estimate for turnaround time from, from when we receive the sample to when the results are completed. Um, and the genomic sequencing process does take upwards of 72 hours. So that does uh, you know, create a little bit of a lengthier analysis timeline than many of the chemical fertility tests. But we're, our lab team is always striving to get that turnaround time down. And, and at two to three weeks, we currently have a very strong industry standard for um, genomic sequencing sample turnaround time. Um, oh, one great question that I could probably talk about for like an hour is how do you guys like to tie in the bee crop and the Haney soil health test? So we're, as I mentioned at the start of, of the webinar, we're big fans of the Haney soil health test. Um, we, the way that the Haney tends to complement our test is the Haney touches on soil biology by measuring uh, respiration and relating that to microbial uh, microbial activity and cycling nutrients. Particularly, the Haney test is very strong when it comes to carbon and nitrogen as well and phosphorus as well. Um, what I love about the Haney test is that it looks at both uh, inorganic and organic nitrogen. What we look at on the bee crop test it are the microbes that drive the conversion of nitrogen from the organic form, which you know is not readily plant available, um, to the inorganic forms, ammonia and nitrate. So the Haney test really measures those those uh, basically the the bank accounts for you know organic and inorganic nitrogen. So how much do you have that's plant available? And then it all and then the bee crop test looks at the you know the basically the workers, the employees who are driving the differences, you know, between those those accounts or those those stores of, of nitrogen. Um, so similar for phosphorus, you know, the Haney test out of Regen Ag Labs also looks at um, organic and inorganic phosphorus, and it also looks at carbon. So a lot of conventional um, chemical fertility tests do not take into account carbon very closely. <coughs> The Haney test looks at a variety of parameters related to microbial, you know, microbially active carbon um, and total carbon. And that is, of course, the limiting fuel source for most soil microbes, that carbon. So the Haney test really gives us some very relevant data to, to the soil biology metrics that we look at in the bee crop test. You know, we're looking at the microbes that sequester and cycle carbon and, and their potential to move carbon around. The Haney test tells us what form that, you know, to what extent do you have total carbon. Um, so that helps inform maybe, you know, do microbes have a lot of carbon to utilize? <laughs> work on introducing carbon. Should we use cover crops that will introduce more carbon? And then you can see whether microbes are effectively cycling and, and potentially sequestering that carbon in the soil. Um, I, I could probably keep droning on and on, but there's a lot of great ties between the, the Haney test um, and our bee crop test, um, and, and some some overlap, but a lot of complementary data where we can kind of see the broader picture of how you know the chemical fertility, the nutrients in various forms relate to the microbes that cycle those nutrients between various forms. So it's just a, uh, a an an advanced dimension of of uh, soil health insights when you combine both the the Haney and the bee crop test. I also want to mention that we work with Regen Ag Labs and. Um, can have the Haney test performed in conjunction with bee crop tests. So if you send a sample to us or Regen, um, that sample can be analyzed for both the Haney and bee crop. And then you'll get a what we call the bee crop plus report, which has uh, some of the Haney data integrated into the bee crop report. Um, so that way you can have the tests, you know, performed on, on you know, both tests performed on the same sample. Um, and of course, you know, Regen, we work very closely with, and they're, they're great experts on interpreting the Haney test. <laughs> happy to work with you very close. You know, we can provide some insights on the Haney and, and refer any questions to Regen. 
Um, but we can, of course, look at how those Haney parameters relate back to our Vcrop results. Um, let's see, I think we might have time for one more um, quick question. Um, in general, what time of year is best to sample? So standard soil test protocols. So really quickly, I'll say we're, the Vcrop test is very versatile. It can, it can be, you know, samples can be taken um, for, before planting. Like these samples we looked at um, with Michelle were taken before planting. They can be taken after harvest. If there's one most optimal time, it probably would be in season because that's when the plant is growing. It's most actively interacting with the soil microbes. You know, diseases may be present. But for the sake of decision making, any data, any samples taken before planting or after harvest will still be very relevant. Um, it will still help inform, you know, if, if management practices need to be made in, in season, it's great to, to get that data ahead of time. So you can take samples pretty much any time of year. We just don't recommend taking samples when the soil is uh, completely frozen. I would wait until it's at least fairly thawed. Um, the microbes will generally go inactive the, the colder it gets, so they won't necessarily die off. But it's just hard to get a soil core in the ground when it's frozen. And generally, um, and when it's completely frozen, the microbial metabolism is going to be much lower than when the when it's you know in the maybe 50, 60 degrees or higher. So you can still sample when it's when it's cold out. Just uh, we we don't recommend sampling when the when the ground is completely frozen over. Um, and I know we have a couple more questions here. We'll be sure to answer and address those questions offline and and get those. Um, those answers to anyone who, who did pose any we didn't get to. Um, we're, we're up past time today, but I wanna thank everyone for tuning in. And of course, thank you to the farm babe, Michelle Miller for joining. We're really happy with these results. And um, yeah, really, really um, glad to bring your platform and, and your great mission to uh, integrate with our mission at, at Biomakers and what we do with Crop. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank you to Biomakers and thank you to everyone who joined. Great. Thanks, Michelle. Take care, everyone. Hope to talk to you soon. Feel free to reach out to us anytime and um, and uh, happy growing season. Hope everyone's growing season is going well. Um, take care. Thank you. Thanks. Bye.